I've studied computer science engineering and then I got a PhD in data science and uh, recently I've done another master's in human movement sciences and high performance coaching. So more related to uh, human physiology and super science since that's uh, anyway the field um, where my technology is applied and also that is uh, my current interest. So uh, I decided to go back to university and, and do another master's there, which I'm finishing this year. And I've started HRV for training about seven years ago, uh, worked about 10 years uh, modeling physiological data for different applications, uh, published a few papers, uh, and that's a bit of the background. Uh, so this uh, how it started about uh, 11 years ago. This is um, the first Android phone and uh, a sort of device I had built to connect it to an ECG, uh, so a sensor that could track uh, heart activity. And this is the state of the app now, which is a bit more user friendly, and that's uh, that's also what we will be talking about uh, as the main point of this technology for me is really to make it easy to use, uh, cost effective, you know, it's just, it's just an app and then um, this improves compliance, makes it easier for people to use it, but it's really important that we don't sacrifice accuracy and still we can measure accurately uh, cardiac activity. Uh, the reason why we, we do this is uh, first awareness, you know, stress comes from many sources and I think our goal is really to try to help individuals, apart from athletes, any individual to better understand how different stressors affect us so that we can manage that better. Uh, and of course, that means uh, actionability. So being able to uh, make changes to what we do uh, in terms of training prescription, but also in terms of how we handle other stressors so that we can uh, optimize this process and, uh, and thrive as athletes and individuals. So today I want to talk about uh, what's heart rate variability. So um, a tiny bit of theory, uh, how to collect data, technologies that are available uh, on the market, guidelines uh, for the measurements, uh, data analysis and interpretation. So what to look at in the data, and then a bit of the pro platform, which is the platform also for coaches that you could use to monitor your athletes uh, remotely and to check physiological trends and, and see how they're responding to training and other stressors. So artery variability is, um, well, basically just uh, what we refer to is just the difference between consecutive beats. I just have a question here. Do you see also my cursor? Like if I move it around, do you see it or? Like if anyone can just answer in the in the chat or just speaking, uh, if you see the yeah. mouse, okay, perfect. Great. Uh, so as you can see here, there is uh, there are differences between consecutive bits, uh, and that's what we are what we measure. Uh, here you can see also a minute of data where you have the RR intervals, so the time differences between these bits that vary between about 8:50 and 11. 100 milliseconds. So obviously there is always some variability. And the bigger question here is why do we care about this variability? And the reason is that basically this variability gives us insights into the autonomic nervous system, uh, which controls and regulates uh, much of what happens in the body. Um, and uh, it does that again uh, without our uh, conscious control. Uh, and it does that to maintain a state of balance, which is necessary for optimal functioning. So as the body responds to different stresses in a similar way, regardless of where the stressor comes from, uh, it modulates heart activity. And by measuring then these differences in heartbeats, we can get insights into how um, we are responding to stress. And in particular, the one aspect that is um, very clearly captured with uh, these uh, short HRV measurements that we do. And when I say short, I mean anything between one and five minutes. So uh, the long measurements would be what uh, what the medical community used to do in, in the old days with, uh, with the halter monitors that would track the full day. So when we do these short measurements, we have good insights in, on uh, parasympathetic activity because uh, basically the autonomic nervous system innervates the heart and modulates heart activity. Uh, in a way that is captured uh, by heart rate variability um, from a, let's say, mathematical point of view. Uh, this reflects very well these fast changes which are uh, peculiar of parasympathetic activity. 
So if we want to really simplify uh, how this works is that when we have higher stress, normally we have a reduced HRV uh, because we have a reduced parasympathetic activity. So the system is inhibited uh, when there is more stress and more need for recovery. And on the other hand, we have higher HRV when we are uh, when we have higher parasympathetic activity and the body is uh, less stressed. We will see that the way the different stressors um, have an impact uh, is uh, is a bit more complicated than this, and there are always many stressors at the same time, but there are clear trends that we can capture, and uh, I will show a lot of examples because I think that's uh, eventually the, the easiest way to, um, to fully grasp uh, what we're talking about and how these metrics can, can help you in your work. And before uh, we go into uh, some more details on the technology and on the, on the best practices and how to use it, I have just some um, early examples of uh, physiological responses to acute stressors, which uh, I think are one of the easiest thing, uh, things to, to start with um, in terms of understanding how we respond to stress. So when we talk about acute stressors, we talk about strong stressors that have an impact uh, on our physiology uh, right after or for the next uh, 24 uh, to 48 hours. For example, you know, a strong, um, let's say a hard workout or uh, intercontinental travel, anything that has, you know, that strong acute impact that does not last uh, very long. And so it's just a matter of, you know, a few hours to a day or two. In the context of training, there is something we have looked at also across uh, the population. And what I want to show is simply how, uh, if we look at the responses in physiology, in resting heart rate and HRV on a day-to-day -day basis, we can rely on uh, HRV as a more sensitive metric than heart rate to capture the body response to training. Here we have uh, in this plot changes in heart rate and in this plot changes in HRV. We have different age groups and then we have uh, two categories. So here people annotated their training as low intensity or high intensity. And what we can see is basically how much HRV changed on the day after after an, an easy training and after a hard training. So we can see that heart rate is consistently a bit higher after hard trainings with respect to their normal. Uh, and after easy trainings, there is a, a reduction. So this is consistent with the fact that heart rate would be higher when there is higher stress. And with HRV, we have the same relationship, but the other way around, of course, because HRV is lower when there is more stress. And we can see also here the data is in percentage so that you can see quite clearly that uh, the extent of the reduction is higher in HRV. And, you know, in the old days, uh, we used to just rely on heart rate to do basically what we do today with, with HRV. So to measure um, how an athlete is responding to training and other stressors using heart rate, which was, I think, a good starting point. But as the technology got better, it's easier to measure HRV with respect to, to the old days. Now, I think we can rely on these metrics that are also more sensitive to these uh, forms of stress training included. Some other examples, uh, there is just an individual. Uh, we have a period in which there is frequent traveling. Uh, so uh, basically every other day um, traveling um, for work and then here we have a period in which uh, this person was not traveling uh, both periods are a month of data you can see our hrv uh, is consistently lower this tells you simply that you know there is more stress in the body and of course this limits the capacity of this individual to also train uh, effectively um, this is a marathon runner um, a good age group runner here we have um, with the effect of alcohol. So uh, again, we have uh, three categories, again, self annotated, and we can see that uh, there is no difference between uh, having a glass of, uh, of wine, for example, and no, um, and no alcohol intake. When, while, when there is more, we have a significant decrease uh, in HRV, via strong difference between the two conditions and getting sick. Similar situation here is daily uh, HRV and here is daily heart rate for one person 
Uh, and we can see uh, quite clearly the drop here in HRV and uh, the increase in heart rate. And this is a visualization that we will see more later. Uh, it's the one that I think is the most useful. Uh, and um, yeah, again, I, I will show plenty of examples later, but here I just want to make a point. Uh, you know, again, stress comes from different sources, and it is important to understand that when we use these metrics, we can really try to capture um, all of these sources because anyway, our capacity to handle stress is limited. And here we can see how the effect of, for example, running a marathon uh, or, you know, spending some time, uh, let's say, in a less ordinary routine, um, having maybe, you know, uh, an extra glass of wine and things like that cause actually a very similar physiological response, uh, despite the fact that these are two extremely different forms, forms of stress. Um, and uh, again, I just want to make a point that uh, this is why it matters to track these parameters. It's, it's not, it is not just training, right? So otherwise we have all our ways to track training load. And, you know, if the output is always just linked to training load, then we would already know what to expect. But people react differently to different stresses. Uh, and here, you know, by tracking HRV or resting heart rate, you can see how the body responds and also how quickly it goes back to normal, which can change between individuals. And then you can, you know, implement changes accordingly. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I just said. So, you know, again, our capacity to and the stress is limited. Uh, you will see the slides, some of them are really packed with text. I think that's uh, mostly for you later. We, I will share this deck so that you can see everything again, uh, apart from uh, the recording that I think is being taken. But um, I will I will also share the deck and, uh, and everything that I will present today here. Talking about how to collect the data, So with um, with our app, we have developed the first system that can acquire HRV with the camera. All right, there is a question. Um, resting heart rate, I think, is uh, is useful. It's a useful metric. It's a bit less sensitive to these forms of stress. Uh, I think, in general, we would really want to look at uh, both of them. So I don't think there is one signal that is going to tell you, you know, everything you need to know. Uh, they respond also differently not only to stress, but also to training. Uh, you know, the classic changes in resting heart rate because you're becoming more fit and your resting heart rate over periods of weeks and months slowly decreases. I think that's, uh, you know, a useful way to look at resting heart rate, which is different from HRV. You don't expect necessarily to see the same changes in HRV. I uh, will talk a bit about this later. Uh, HRV is more something that you use continuously as a feedback loop to balance stress, not necessarily a marker of fitness that way. So, you know, there are there are differences. Um, and in the context of, of stress, I would first look at HRV, but then when we try to, you know, get the full picture and we also look at the training load, uh, subjective data, how the athlete feels, um, and then we look at HRV and resting heart rate. And I think it's uh, uh, at that point, once we have all of this uh, data and trends and uh, that we can uh, better understand what is actually going on and uh, if things uh, are going according to plans or if you need to implement any changes. All right, so back to the data collection. Uh, so we have our camera based system. Uh, there are a few others now. Uh, the main difference is that we have actually validated this so you can rely that you know, trust that it is accurate. Um, it's pretty simple. You take the measurement first thing in the morning, and the way it works is that the, you know the flash light is on, and then we take a video of your finger, uh, and basically through the camera we can see changes in skin color due to the blood flowing, and that of course uh, is linked to the heart beating, and we can extract that information, and. Uh, compute this signal, which um, is used to compute the bit-to-bit -bit differences uh, and eventually uh, the heart rate viability. I have here an example of the data where you can see in uh, red the bit-to-bit -bit differences over a minute extracted from the camera. And then in uh, blue, you have 
um, the polar strap, which is also another very accurate sensor, and then a full ECG, um, and then you see the overlap. Uh, so basically, you can just use any of these systems, uh, and they are all as reliable. There are other ways you can measure. Um, since last October, you can use uh, the Apple Watch and also get all the same metrics because they started um, providing bit-to-bit -bit data as well in the health app, and we carried that. Uh, and we've also validated this, so the Apple Watch is also very accurate. Um, it's a bit less straightforward to use sometimes because you cannot directly use it to measure. You have to go through this Breathe app they have. Um, so you need to use that, take a measurement, and then read your data back in our app, but it can be used. So if, uh, if your athletes have it, uh, it's a viable alternative. Uh, the Scotch Rhythm 24 iron band, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's used also for, for heart rate during training. Um, it has two modalities, uh, a heart rate modality that you should use when training, and then HIV modality that provides accurate bit-to-bit -bit data. Uh, at rest uh, when there is absolutely no movement, so that's also reliable. Uh, the core sense, which is made by Elite HRV, is also it's a finger sensor, which is also valid and accurate. Otherwise, the the usual polar straps. Um, this is all in the context of the morning measurement, which is normally what I recommend doing. Um, and the only alternative is a night measurement, and for this. Uh, normally, we recommend the Aura Ring, which also integrates with the app and also has been validated. So it's an accurate device to measure um, HRV during the night. In this case, then we would use the average of the night uh, instead of the morning measurement for, uh, for the analytics. All right, before we move into the guidelines, uh, if you have any questions on uh, the technologies used for data collection, Please write them in the chat. Okay. In terms of uh, guidelines, so this is very important. Oops. Okay, there was a bit of luck. The ticker chest strap should work fine. Um, I'm saying should just because uh, from users we had a bit of a mixed feedback, meaning that when it works, it works well, especially when using Bluetooth. I think the strap also supports Ant, uh, which you can use on Android. Uh, but then uh, in that case, it does not seem to, it does not seem to be as reliable. So I would recommend even on Android to use it always over Bluetooth. Uh, and the, the, the sensor should be accurate, so um, the ticker strap should also work well, even though we did not uh, validate it. But uh, from from what I've seen so far, uh, I would say that's uh, also a good alternative. The Garmin strap also is good. The problem there is only that um, I think only the latest strap supports Bluetooth. Uh, so the regular strap that supports only Ant can be used only on certain Android phones that have the on radio because iPhones do not uh, use that protocol. All right. The confounding factors. Um, so there is. A, um, sorry, another question. Um, yeah, there is a good question, um, Paul, on uh, the Android um, camera. Uh, basically, so Android, obviously, there is a lot of fragmentation, a lot of different phones and versions, so things are less standard than on iPhones. So while we support all iPhones on Android, we support about 90-95% of the phones. But what we do there is to detect if the phone is supported. So there are, there is another system in place that when you use it, it's going to tell you if your phone is supported, so we don't just uh, you know, spread out uh, incorrect numbers. We check and then we communicate it to the user. Uh, and if there are issues, we recommend one of the sensors or we can give you a refund. That's never a problem, but uh, it's important indeed that the app is able to determine if a specific phone and camera uh, is supported. And then uh, we, we do that um, in the app. All right. Back to the confounding factors. So since uh, HRV captures parasympathetic activity and um, 
you know, the activity of the autonomic nervous system, obviously it we capture a response to anything we do, uh, you know, from exercise to caffeine to just, you know, um, circadian rhythm, anything else that happens in the day. Uh, and that's why it's really important to measure at a time where you are not impacted by all of these factors. And that's really the only reason why we have the morning routine and the, the measurement we recommend doing it first thing in the morning. Uh, you know, sometimes there is a sort of a misconception that you should measure that time because, you know, at that time your HRV is higher or your resting heart rate is lower, but it's not even true. You know, there are still fluctuations during the day and, you know, the same way you have um, stressors that increase your heart rate and decrease your HRV, like, I don't know, caffeine uh, or exercise, you have also other kind of stressors like, um, let's say, positive, let's call them positive, that have the opposite effect, like meditation or, uh, you know, yoga or any other type of exercise that is actually stimulating parasympathetic activity and therefore uh, the point of the morning routine is not uh, to, to achieve a certain value, but it's really just about doing it at a, mo in, at a time in which you do not have all these confounding effects, uh, confounding factors, and then you can, uh, you know, have this reproducible context. So something that you can do every day and it's always the same because, you know, you just woke up and you haven't done anything yet. So in general, that's really the only moment in which it makes sense to take this measurement. Yeah. So again, first thing in the morning, while relaxed, uh, that way we limit all these external stressors. Um, yeah, this is highly correlated with night measurements. That, as I mentioned, it's uh, the other alternative um, that that we that we recommend. And really anything affects you, uh, even, you know, all sorts of psychological stressors. So if you, I don't know, something negative comments online, a stressful email, uh, social media, like all of that should really be avoided before your measurements. I think uh, you can probably relate to this if you read something, I don't know, you can feel it quite easily that if you get pissed or frustrated, your heart rate raises and, you know, at the same time your HIV is going down and you don't want to capture it you know, your baseline physiology exactly at that moment. So we always recommend not to do anything um, before the measurement. And of course, you can have a slightly different routine if it's not possible to measure in bed. Uh, that's no problem. You can go to another room. You can go to the bathroom. You can sit there. Um, it doesn't matter as long as it's the same routine every day. So, you know, there's people with uh, small kids or other reasons why you might not be able to measure first thing in the morning in bed, but you can still uh, try to build a routine that, that works for you and, uh, and is consistent over time. On um, body positioning, uh, normally we say lying down just because it's simpler. Uh, if you work with athletes that have very low heart rate, and I mean lower than 35 beats per minute, at rest, then uh, it could be a good idea to uh, sit. Standing in general, I do not recommend it, mostly because people don't have any patience. So uh, if, you, if you tell them to stand, they will stand and then measure right away. Uh, and of course, then you just measure the, you know, the, all the readjusting in your body because you are standing. Uh, you should instead wait a minute so that you are again. Um, relaxed and rested and then measured so it's just easier to sit at that point uh, or to lie down if uh, if heart rate is not extremely low in terms of uh, how many measurements you need from your athletes um, four or five times uh, literature says down to three you could get away and get a reliable baseline of course you lose information because you at that point you can rely only on the baseline so on um, the moving average of, uh, of these three values. While if you record daily, um, you have more information and learn more also about day-to-day -day fluctuations. Um, sometimes it's just easier again to do it every day because you make it a routine. Uh, and then, you know, you don't have to remember which days you have to do it and, and not. But uh, yeah, it depends a bit on, on the athlete, of course. And some athletes are extremely compliant with others. Uh, it's a bit more difficult and uh, we need to remind them more often. All right, um, I'll just wait a minute for questions on, uh, on the guidelines before I 
go into the data. Yeah, exactly. Tim asked um, if you use an alarm, um, what input might it have? Uh, and yes, indeed, uh, you just uh, you just need to rest, uh, relax. Uh, you know, thirty seconds, minute, uh, as soon as when you wake up, and then uh, take your measurement. It's uh, you know, I, I try to stress this a lot about the importance of the morning routine, but of course there is some margin. You know? So, um, for example, we did a study. Uh, recently with uh, team athletes, you know, well, working, I don't know exactly your setup, but working with triathletes normally is a bit easier because they are, um, let's say, even in a team, you treat them as individuals a bit more than in a football team, so to speak, where, you know, everybody needs to do the same. Um, and then, uh, you know, you need to get um, or either all the authors to do this or nobody would do, want to do it because you know you need to integrate it in your um in, in the way you manage your athletes while with triathletes normally you know if there is if there are athletes that are in the mood for doing this and have no problem doing their measurements then uh you use it with them and then you still have other athletes that don't use it and, and you know it doesn't create any problem because you know every training problem is is very individualized um but yeah, so back to the study I was mentioning. So with with teams, often the idea is that you could also get all the all the players uh, at the facilities and then measure there. So we did this study where they would measure first thing in the morning and then also two hours later at the facilities, trying to limit still confounding factors and resting, you know, a few minutes before measuring once they got to the facilities. And so, you know, there is more variability. You need to get there and then maybe you had breakfast or maybe you had coffee, but still the data was highly correlated as long as this was done, you know, um, an hour or two after the, after waking up and, you know, certainly before training. Um, so I would still highly recommend to ask the athletes to do at home the measurement, but there is, there is some margin. Uh, another question is about the baseline. Uh, I'll talk ab about this uh, a bit later. So you will see we use a lot of data to determine the, the baseline and especially the normal values. And when your uh, baseline goes outside of the normal values, we use up to two months of data. But the, um, the system will start providing feedback after four days already by comparing the daily score to the baseline. So you have basically three levels, the daily score every day. The baseline, it's a week of data, and the normal values is two months of data. As a coach, I think it's really interesting to look at the normal values and the baseline, so a bit more big picture sort of view, but that requires much more data. So to start with, I think it's useful to just look at the daily score and the baseline. So at the shorter uh, time frame, time scale, uh, which is um, also, re let's say it relates more to the acute stressors, you know, these uh, strong temporary stressors more than uh, long term adaptations, simply because you don't have enough data yet. Um, but you can still use it that way to, you know, see, for example, a given day your data is your HRV is particularly low, your parasympathetic activity is highly suppressed. Still, you can use that information, for example, to lower the intensity of, of the training uh, for that given day. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show a bit more of this, uh, of these principles soon. All right, so how do we use the data? Um, first thing, uh, back to that example that I was doing, uh, was saying before on, on heart rate changing over time and uh, HIV being used more as a sort of a feedback loop. I think here the more important point is uh, this, that we need really to, to think a bit differently from the typical performance metrics where, you know, we always try to obtain, achieve a certain value. When we look at physiological data, we really want things to be in our in a normal range, especially in terms of HRV. Um, and this is also where I think we do um, 
a good job with our platform and something that if you use another platform, I would recommend simply just to try to find ways to visualize the data in a similar way. Um, so basically to understand how HRV is changing for an athlete with respect to what is normal for that athlete uh, and, you know, going a bit, uh, moving a bit away from the old way of doing this, which was really an oversimplification of everything. Like, you know, you have a higher score is better kind of mentality, especially when you, you know, you have, we will see, so, uh, maybe I just go show it here again. If you look at this and you see the gray bars here, these are the daily scores. You see there is like huge viability on a day to day basis, right? So we cannot, you know, just say, OK, today there is an increase or a decrease and then we make a change, right? There will, there will always be decreases and increases, and it's really important that we understand when those changes are significant. For example, when there is, you know, uh, something that is really outside of the normal for this person because you know this what this uh, band is showing us the normal values is simply where we expect the data to be unless there is some major stressor and then you know something odd going on um let me see I have another question yeah, so we have uh, so between uh, differences in men and women. I think the strongest um, factor, of course, that makes a lot of sense to include in the analysis is uh, the effect of the menstrual cycle. And I have some slides later, so I will show you that um, there are fluctuations during the cycle that I think uh, it's really important that we consider because otherwise, you know, you could just derive the wrong conclusions because uh you know you you see changes and uh you don't know exactly why there is a certain change and uh so there are there has been research also recently maybe i'll just jump in there let's see yeah so this uh study where they actually use the hrv for training to um track hrv during the cycle and uh you know there has been much uh, literature before but always, you know, with one measurement uh, in, a, in every phase of the cycle or, you know, just a few measurements and then most research showed a decrease uh, in HRV during the cycle, but other um, papers showed the opposite and, you know, the problem is always the same. There is so much day-to-day -day variability that, you know, if you just pick one day in the first part of the cycle and one day in the second part, then you could have, you know, you could see the opposite relation instead of the decrease that you actually see, simply because you did not collect data every day. So I think that's why it matters to really do this daily. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, this study showed consistently these reductions. So I think that's uh, something, for example, that we can uh, that we should always you know uh, keep track of and um, and consider because you know, often in some individuals we can see quite clearly that there is always this reduction during the second phase um, and therefore in that case we simply know that that's the reason and we don't you know read anything else into it i hope that uh, answers your question all right back to the normal values as I was saying, you know, normal in terms of HRV is good and, uh, you know, HRV is about continuous feedback so that we manage stress and we don't have all these jumps up and down or reductions, but we keep um, things within our normal. Um, and as I was saying, we do that in the app using the past 60 days of data in the system. So you do your measurement as, uh, as I said before, and then you get a score. This is your parasympathetic activity. So lower means more stress. Uh, after four days, you start getting also baseline, which is always computed using the last seven days. And then the app will compare your daily score with your normal values. So with what's your expected uh, HRV using up to two months of data. And then if your HRV is lower, then we will communicate that to the athlete or to you. So here is an example again. We see much variability, but only in this instance, the data is 
lower than this person's normal. So we have ways to visualize that in the app and in the pro platform, this uh, uh, advanced user or coach uh, platform where I think we make things a bit easier to read. Um, when you, again, you look at the big picture, here we have a few months of data, the baseline, uh, and then you know you can see quite clearly when there is higher stress uh, and because the baseline goes outside of the normal range. In the context of training load, I think there is something also important to discuss. Uh, before I showed briefly how after hard sessions we could see consistently reductions in HRV when looking at the data for each individual over periods of months. So that is, of course, the whole principle why uh, we start uh, using HRV to track changes in, um, in response to training for athletes so that we can optimize their training programs. But HRV is really about adaptation and response to training. So if we respond well to training. We don't expect reductions in HRV, even if we are in a periods of high load. On the contrary, HRV should be in that case um, stable or even increasing to show that the athlete is adapting well to the stressor and the increased training load. So that's, uh, I think, one of the most important aspects, and I will show some data soon. Um, and again, in the context of training, we normally have reductions in the in the longer term only if um, you know this is something extremely new for the athlete in terms of the training stimulus or the volume uh, or if there are non training related stresses that are also affecting recovery so these are the reasons that normally are behind um, changes in hrv uh, that are considered negative but if you know we are working with an athlete that is going through a cycle of increased load, uh, maybe an experienced athlete, then we certainly want to use the metric as uh, feedback and confirmation that everything is going well, um, and uh, and we should not see reductions. Here is an example of this. We have uh, this standard training load uh, plot. Probably you are familiar with it. There is something like this um, in training peaks or or basically every every training uh, load monitoring tool with acute load uh, here is in orange and then you have chronic load in blue so we have an increased acute load and we have a positive response hrv is stable within normal slight increase but you know anything within normal we can just consider it stable um, and this is exactly what you want to see in your athletes when when training is going well here we see uh, context, so this is uh, a panel where we have, again, HRV on top, training load, and here is subjective data um, or, or other metrics. In this case, it's sleep time, so it's not really subjective, but it's, you know, contextual metrics that can help you also making sense of the data. Uh, you know, just, just HRV without context is always very difficult to interpret, so you need to add information. Here we have uh, one or two nights with very poor sleep, and then we can see uh, that it takes a really long time to this person physiologically to just recover from that. So I think this is useful because it gives you an insight on, you know, uh, how bad can it be for the body? even though, you know, you just really have one night, which is very low in sleep time, and then we go very high again. And here we have days even above normal, but still, you know, for the body that was really stressful. So by looking at the objective data, you can get some more insights or some uh, when it's time to, for example, go hard again here. Training was kept very low. You can see the acute load is always lower. So that's was probably an attempt to not to overload the body at, the, at that time. Here we have uh, other stressors, lifestyle stress. There is uh, again subjective, someone, uh, you know, anyone can tag it or annotate it differently based on, you know, whatever they do or is relevant in terms of stress in their life. Uh, here we can see for me it was work. 
uh, and you know there are several weeks in which there are frequent low scores until the baseline also goes below normal and then stays there for a long time. Uh, and you know training load is constant is constant in this in this period. So um, again, the importance of really looking at context, other stressors, and understanding um, what is happening. Here is a triathlete. Uh, it's a year of data. And we can see many different uh, things happening here. There is an accident, a broken wrist. We can see um, a very poor period. Uh, here we have uh, altitude training camp. We can see, you know, when the camp starts, there is a continuous decline in HRV. Uh, this was, I think, also the first time that this person was going to a camp. Uh, and you know, uh, struggling to adapt. And then uh, there's a race here. We have um, work stress and again, baseline below normal values. And you can see, you know, throughout the year, there is there are a lot of changes and the normal values also change because of these changes. But you can always see the short uh, to medium term stressors showing up as changes outside of what is normal. Um, you know, in the, also the normal values, you know, sometimes in papers you find them uh, as a sort of straight uh, box, but you know, it's, um, I, I would say, hardly ever the case that uh, in a research paper you have years of data, uh, and I think it's meaningful to update these values the way we do here. Uh, normally when you look at uh, data for studies, it's always a few weeks to a few months, so you could get away with keeping the normal values constant, but I think it makes sense to adapt them slowly over time as well. Here we have also getting sick again and the usual um, decline in HIV with that. Here is um, another athlete that is struggling every time there is increased load. We can see it here, continuous decline below normal. Here again an increase and we go below normal. And now instead reducing significantly load goes, uh, you know, reduces stress this way. Uh, question on sleep apnea. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, any, um, any sort of uh, issue, I would say, uh, shows up that way. That's why it's interesting. I think you don't even, often you don't need to track anything else, you just track the outcome of everything that is happening, which is your physiological stress. Then, of course, having information on the other parameters like we've seen here, it's useful because you can try to understand what is causing the change in HRV and maybe implement changes, but still you would see it in the data. Um, here again on training load, we don't see the training load here, but this is annotated. So there is um, an increase in HRV consistent with uh, aerobic training and, and good sleep. So again, positive response. HRV is really about how we respond. Here there was travel for a few days uh, for work, and you know this athlete um, suffered this quite a bit, very low values, and, and they bring the baseline down. And uh, normal training again uh, with a positive response and a race uh, with a bit of ups and downs afterwards uh, as the person recovers uh, from the event. Uh, this one is um, a situation in which, uh, in theory, there was nothing particularly going on, but there is a, a very large reduction. So there is something that many coaches have been telling me over the time is like the way they use it sometimes is not really prescriptive. They don't use HRV even to implement changes, but they use it as a tool to start a conversation with the athlete, right? Sometimes something is going on, like here, it was clear, something was clearly going on. And then by looking at the data, you're like, okay, what is happening? And then you go back to the athlete and try to go over things and, and figure out that, you know, Maybe there was some some significant stressor at home, uh, things that eventually will have an impact on training, and then maybe it's more difficult to identify without objective data. And uh, I just wanted to show us an example of this. Um, yeah, again, other stressors and injury. 
Um, sorry, another question here. Yeah, so during my New York Marathon, HIV was already low because of other stressors. Then I did also the marathon, so it stayed slow for a bit. And then all of these stressors were gone. Uh, half of them was university and then the race. Uh, then, you know, exams were done, race was done. Like mentally, I was recovered physically as well after a few days. Um, and then things went back up and then I kept training consistently. Uh, and that was reflected by the positive values uh, until again, indeed, uh, New Year's Eve and those days when I was back in Italy um, and I had the second dip. That answers your question. All right. Um, yeah, here I was saying it's an injury, so there is no training load, but HIV goes down. And again, I just want to speak to the fact that it's not just training load, right? It's everything that is going on. Uh, and here is not the injury itself, it's how we respond to the injury also mentally and what we do because you know you cannot train and maybe you get a bit depressed, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and then you can capture that again in the data. This is a bit dense, um, I will skip it. The menstrual cycle, we talked about it. We have this um, typical reduction um, in HIV during the second part. Uh, often these are fluctuations that are still within normal values. And again, this is a year of data, so a lot is going on. Uh, apart from the menstrual cycle, of course, there is, you know, there's also a person that prepared a marathon during this period, the first marathon. So, you know, training load very different from her normal. Uh, so again, uh, in the platform, then you will be able to see things a bit differently, subjectively, how stress is going. Uh, HRV, how's that going? Here is annotated by location. So, you know, when there is travel, training load. Well, I, since I'm here, we'll just talk about this then. We can see there is two periods of travel that are annotated as high stress. Uh, the first one here, HRV is going down, but we reduced load. So the acute load is very low. So we know that that way we don't compromise the situation. The second time around, we cannot do that is the race. So, you know, you just have to deal with it. Uh, but then you can use what follows to understand when it's uh, when we are recovered and when we can re resume things. So, you know, sometimes you have you can play, of course, with some of these variables to keep things in check. Some other times that's that's more complicated, especially if you're racing. All right, so this should give uh, an overview, hopefully, um, of the awareness bit. So, you know, looking at HRV can, and other parameters can help you understand how things are going. As a coach, uh, of course, your goal is to improve performance for your athletes. So there is plenty of research in training prescription using HRV. So the most solid bits uh, that have been uh, investigated recently, I think, um, show, um, um, let's say, employ a consistent approach, which is uh, similar to what I just have just shown. So, you know, they use also this concept of the normal values and of the baseline. And what they do is, uh, you know, when the, <clears throat> the principle is simply to apply the, you know, the most appropriate training stimuli at the right time. Uh, and that simply most of the times means that there are uh, periods in which the body is already overloaded. Uh, there is there is stress uh, coming from different sources and you don't want to add too much stress at that point because our again our capacity for stress is limited so all of these studies do the same um, for example they would reduce training intensity when the baseline is below normal values when there is uh, another situation in which you know the baseline is increasing or it's within normal then they would just keep things um, as planned so there have been in particular, two studies recently, one on cyclists and one on runners. 
uh, both of them, uh, two different groups, one in Finland, one in, in Spain, but both of them using this approach where they would have a regular uh, training periodization, uh, you know, periods of high load and lower and periods of uh, deload recovery. And then the only thing they would do is if the baseline is below normal, when you have a high intensity session scheduled, then they would reduce intensity of that session, which of course doesn't mean rest, right? Especially if you work with uh, uh, elite athletes or good athletes, and uh, reducing intensity simply means reducing intensity, and not resting. So you would just go for a moderate session, even or an easy session if you had a moderate one scheduled. Uh, but basically, just do not stress the body too much in that moment, because you know this situation means that you were already dealing poorly with stress, you know, so uh, this is still in agreement with the fact that sometimes you should overload the body, but should you, you should do that when, you know, you are also dealing well with that stressor, otherwise you end up in a situation in which it's just going to take longer to recover. Uh, and the insights from these studies was actually that uh, both studies in both studies the groups that use the hrv guided training so the ones that were holding back from time to time obviously they had accumulated less training at high intensity um a bit less because some sessions had to reduce intensity but they performed better uh, at the end of the study so still them they uh, possibly adapted better to the stimulus that was given um, and uh, i think that's uh, that's an important insight And I would say to conclude on this, um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I read a lot of weird things online. Sometimes people get really sensitive about uh, metrics and, uh, you, you know, there's, I don't think it makes any sense to compare HRV to subjective metrics or to say that one is better than the other. Uh, all of this matters if we want to understand how an athlete is responding to training uh, or to other stressors. And I think the best we can do is to have a combined approach in which we track all of this, uh, which is quite simple. I mean, training is tracked automatically with, uh, you know, watches and everything we use. Uh, with the app, we can measure HRV and resting heart rate. And there is a questionnaire right after with a lot of questions that you know are plotted the way I showed before, where you can track subjective parameters, um, which give you context and uh, you know can help you also interpret the physiological changes. And uh, I think once we have the three, um, these three, uh, we can we can really start um, better understanding the full picture here and, and how athletes respond and help them get better. Now I just show a bit. Well, I can stop here actually first. If there is anything on uh, on these aspects, um, I can answer now before I show some screenshots of the of the system about the case studies. So the setup normally is quite simple. As I was saying, you have the app, which is used uh, in the morning for the measurement and the questionnaire. As a coach, you have the web platform where you can monitor compliance and look at the trends. Uh, this is how it would look. You have your panel, you see each athlete and their score and their subjective score and the daily advice, which is how the app, the app combines the HRV and subjective scores. Uh, for each athlete, you can see um, just from the panel their daily score and their normal range. So you can quickly see, you know, if it's below what is normal for them. Uh, and then, of course, you can jump to this view where, you, you know, the one we've seen so far, which I think is the most useful to understand um, trends over time. You can configure what Questions are uh, used in the questionnaire in the morning and add also a few uh, custom ones. And then we have various views to, um, you know, again, help you put the, all the information. You, know, you can select subjective parameters, HRV, some other metrics, and see, for example, how all of this is trending this week. 
with respect to the past month, which is shown in gray. Uh, so this should make it easier, you know, to see uh, not only how HRV is trending, but also, you know, how is this athlete sleeping, for example, recently? Because, you know, maybe you see a low value and then you start looking at other parameters and uh, instead of having to scroll down every single variable, you could see here uh, quite easily and quickly uh, how things are, are going. The overview page, I think we discussed it a lot. Um, other uh, screens just that help you uh, analyze the resting physiology and you know determine also which changes are just trivial and which changes are not trivial again based on an athlete's history uh, which can um, can be a bit more informative uh, you know because again there is so much day-to-day -day variability in this matrix that it's really important to try to um, capture which changes are the ones that matter and there's a lot more in the in the system but i don't think uh, that's uh, particularly relevant now. You can you can check it out here, um, and of course reach me if there is any question. But I just wanted to really focus on the physiological part for this talk. And that's all I have. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. <laughs>